So my talk will be on a study we did and the studies we're doing now into the effects of ayahuasca on creativity. Um, I don't think that it needs introduction, but just to start off and that you get used to my voice, uh, ayahuasca is a brew that consists of uh, two uh, plant materials. The first one is the shaka corona. <laughs> And the other one is the copy. So the first one uh, is DMT. It's a fast acting uh, psychedelic substance. And if you don't have the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, the harmine, harmaline, and the tetrahydroharmine, uh, DMT is, works too fast. You have a 15 minute high and then it's over. So it's good that you have these uh, Maui's in the drink, in the brew. So after 45 to 60 minutes, you feel the uh, acute subjective effects, and then uh, these are the typically um, experienced effects. Um, <laughs> yeah. So ayahuasca, you all know that it has a history of 5,000 years. It's been used by shamans, but now it's becoming a bit of yeah. I don't know whether it sounds so bad whether I can say it, it, it's becoming mainstream. If you talk to people, a lot of people have used it or are going on retreats to experience this trip. And um, I know I'm, I'm, from, no, I'm from Belgium, but I work in the Netherlands, and I know that there are a lot of retreats in the Netherlands where you can go for a trip. So I looked it up on Google, and there I found it. This map, um, you see that it is mainly focused here, the retreats in uh, South America, because uh, it's, it's originated over there. But you also see that here in Europe, we also have these retreats. And when I looked at the Netherlands, I saw one retreat. So the website is fooling you because we have more retreats in the Netherlands. I also liked it how they uh, advertise it here. Outer travels, inner journeys. Because, yeah, that's what it is. Um, and then I had another look because in the Netherlands we have these coffee shops where you can buy cannabis, we have head shops and smart shops. And I also found, yeah, here you, you see you can uh, buy a do-it-yourself ayahuasca kit. And here they explain how you can uh, use it. And what I said, I looked it up whether we can buy it in the Netherlands and sure we can buy it. Here you have the two ingredients. You can buy it here. I work over there. <laughs> and, uh, but you can buy it in a lot of places. Um, and then I, I started thinking, is, is this a good thing? Do you want to do it yourself? And they also say, um, but that's not our discussion. We're not going into that. But they also said that you need a couple of trials to uh, get a good brew. But anyway, um, so... My goal was uh, to, to, if you look in, res in, in uh, the research that has been done on ayahuasca, on ayahuasca you see that um, people that have been to these ceremonies, uh, they experience creative expression or enhanced creative expressivity after these uh, retreats. <coughs> And we also know that in diseases like depression, uh, these people experience cognitive inflexibility. <clears throat> so that's why we thought it might be good to have objective evidence that ayahuasca increases cognitive flexibility so that we have, can make a case uh, that it could be suitable in cognitive therapy. So and there are now also a lot of papers coming up on uh, discussing the potential of ayahuasca in uh, the treatment of pathologies like addiction or depression. So that's why we did this study. Um, but if you want to research or investigate creativity, you get the question, what is creativity? It's very hard to define. So I'm going to explain what we did and then yeah, you will see. So we defined, or not only we, but you have a def definition of creativity that it consists of divergent thinking and a phase of convergent thinking. What does this mean? First of all, you have a brainstorm with yourself, you come up with a lot of possibilities, and then you decide what to do, and you have your uh, solution. So here I have an example. 
you can uh, put a problem into two um, uh, for formats. Here you see uh, that you say, I live far from my work, I have a car that um, uses a lot of gasoline, and I want to use less uh, fuel to go to my work. Uh, what can I do? And then you can come up with different solutions, use pu public transportation, uh, walk, I don't know, there are a lot, of, I'm not that good at diverging thinking. They say that sleep lack is good for creativity, but I'm not sure about that. Um, so, and here you have the problem posed as a convergent um, thinking problem. And there you just ask for one solution. I need the best replacement for my car. So, <clears throat> what kind of tasks exist to uh, measure creativity? You have the alternate uses test. What does it do? You get, um, in this problem, you get three objects and you need to think of, of, of as many uses as possible for that object. And here, have a try. When I say paper clip and you get two minutes to come up with as many uses as possible. What would you say? You can use a paper clip too? Open SIM cards. Oh, open SIM cards? Okay. I would think of that as a very original <laughs> use. So here are uh, other examples that people gave. And now it's to the experimenter to score this. And this is a really hard job. What are we looking for? For fluency, how many solutions are you able to come up with in two minutes? And we also have a look at originality. So we only score these um, tests after we had a whole sample of, um, after we tested all our subjects. And then we see if you have an answer that has been given only once, they get the maximal score. If it's an answer that has been given uh, by, I think, 2% of the people, they get a one, and otherwise they get a zero. Um, and then you have this other task, the remote associates, associates test. And this is a test of convergent thinking. So you have to find right answer to the problem. Uh, oh, it's not that I have to finish up. You're warm, yeah. <laughs> um, so you have 30 items, you get 40 minutes, and you have two parallel versions. Um, I want an answer now. What is a word that links these words? So you, it's either a word that you can put in front of it or behind it. Never. <laughs> You're quick. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> or you already knew it. Or you have sleep like, or have drunken ayahuasca. <laughs> <laughs> so um, here we score the number of correct answers. But that's we did not use these two tasks in our research, and I will also explain why. When doing experimental research, you want a task that has uh, a good number of trials. In the first example, you only have three trials. Um, because of re reliability, you, will, you would also like to measure multiple components. You want to know how they do on co convergent and divergent thinking. And you also need to think about time constraints. They drink the brew, and then you want to measure the acute effects, and you have only a limited amount of time. You need parallel versions if you want to use baseline or placebo and the drug effects. And uh, the problem doesn't need to depend on um, understanding a trick. You have these interesting uh, problems. Perhaps you know it. You get a, a box of matches. You get a candle and you get some pins. And then the question is, how can you hook the candle onto the wall? And then if, you, if you've ever seen the answer, you will know how to answer the problem. So you take, you open a box of matches, you put candle in, you put a pin uh, in the candle and the box, and then you put a pin in the wall. And then there you have your chandelier. So we don't need that kind of task. Oh, only 10 minutes, good. I'm always talking too much. Um, so, we, we chose these two tests, I will explain them. The first one is pattern line healing test, it measures divergent thinking. Participants will see these kind of pictures, black and white, and uh, we ask them to come up with as many explanations as possible. So, to get eight items, that's not a lot, and two uh, minutes per item. 
We measure fluency, I explained it to you, originality and then the ratio of both because we want to um, control the, um, the measure for fluency. If you have a lot of answers, uh, they might be not that original or very original. Anyway, doesn't matter. Then the picture concept test, that's an interesting one. Uh, we came up with a test. It measures both convergent and divergent thinking. In the first phase, we ask. They see these kind of uh, stimuli. We have more complex ones with three rows and four uh, pictures. So they have to come up with an association between one of those two and one of those two. That's the correct answer. And then they get time to come up with as many uh, possible associations. And that's in di divergent thinking. And we also score it like this. Uh, our we investigated in, uh, in two settings, two ayahuasca ceremonies. Uh, so it was a bit within subject uh, design. We tested people before they drank to brew and after they drank to brew, but we measured the acute effects. It was a non-religious set setting. We had 26 participants. <coughs> and uh, here you see that the people in group two were a bit older than the people in group one. And they also had a bit more education. Um, the interesting thing is that we were able to take the brew and uh, have it analyzed. And here you see that we also know how many uh, people drank. So you see that in group two, people drank less, group one more. But you also see that there was more DMT in uh, brew two, where people drank less, and less in brew one, where they drank more. Here is an example of, I don't know whether you can read it, I just added it yesterday because it's such fun. Um, so that's the pattern line meaning test. And before ayahuasca, this participant said, well, a woman's breasts definitely uh, don't, don't in a desert or flatland um, like those bio, biospheres in the documentaries, two balls on a plate pl face down, a twin sun are rising on the horizon before ayahuasca. And then they got this uh, after ayahuasca, and then he said, he or she, I don't know, four eyes are observing me on top of a metal throne. The four circles are revolving. The throne is vibrating with energy, spreading uh, fractal-like stripes to the, uh, to the spheres sitting on it. I, here you can see the difference, but they didn't do better on this task after they drank ayahuasca. They weren't more, um, they didn't score that, that well on divergent thinking. I don't have an example of the other task, the uh, task with the pictures, but they did better on that task. So here you see, this is the uh, pictures task with the colorful, colorful pictures. Um, here you see before ayahuasca, after ayahuasca, and this is the total uh, number of solutions they had correct. So after drinking the brew, they were not able to come up with a good solution that often. But here you see the divergent thinking, and that went up after drinking the brew, so the acute effects. Um, what were the strengths of our study? that we measured the acute effects, that we saw this dissociation, bad convergent thinking, good divergent thinking, uh, and that we measured the uh, contents and the volume of the drink. But we were left with un unanswered questions because you would like to know whether these effects are long lasting, right? Um, I have five minutes, I think I'll make it. Um, you also want to know whether there is, oh yeah, an effect of history of ayahuasca use because previous research has shown that if you give or if you drink ayahuasca and you're a naive user, that you're more impaired in your working memory. And then there's the question, is it a ceremony or is it a drink or is it both? So we're now doing a second study. We have contacted a, a number of retreats. We're testing in three retreats in the Netherlands now. And the beauty is, yeah, still have to see whether we are able to come up with uh, enough participants, but that there are uh, ayahuasca naive persons and people that have drank to brew several amount of times, they're also able to take first the ceremony, ceremony only and then drink to brew on the second day. Um, so we're now measuring um, 12 hours after the intake and seven days after the intake so that we can measure the long-lasting effects. 
I'm also interested in measuring the, uh, the association between empathy and creativity because it's known from re research that if you uh, are more empathic, then you are more creative. We we'll st still have to see about that. Um, this is a task I use to uh, measure empathy. Here we measure for the correct expression, whether they can recognize it, that's cognitive empathy. And these two ask for how aroused does this make you feel and how um, much concern you feel for the person, that's emotional empathy. And um, they've shown previously, following either actually, that psilocybin enhances emotional empathy. We've also shown it with uh, MDMA. So, this is a preliminary report, I'm almost done. We have now five persons that we have included in the study. Uh, these are the demographics. I'm, I will proceed to the um, results. So it's only five people. I haven't done statistics, but I wanted to show you. Uh, so this is the cognitive empathy. Are you able to see the right or recognize the right emotion? This is a baseline, so when they didn't drink. And this is the day after they drank the brew. So you see, and this is seven days after. So you see that it improves. I don't know whether I do not suspect that it's going to be statistically significant, but you never know. So they become better at recognizing uh, emotions. Uh, this is how much concern they feel. Here you see that it increases after drinking the brew. And here you see how aroused it makes them feel. And here you also see that it increases. Uh, now, convergent and divergent thinking, we see that, um, yeah, it's the difference, I don't think so, but this is something remarkable, and I'm curious whether it will stay like this. It's like convergent thinking increases uh, seven days after you have uh, <coughs> trying to brew, so we, we will see. <laughs> and then this is divergent thinking, I'm almost there. Um, it seems like it increases like what like we showed, but you also see that there are very large error bars, so it's not statistically significant uh, difference. And here you see that it decreases again after seven days. So it, I'm really curious to see what it gives when we have a full um, data set. I did some correlations, and only um, significant correlation was between arousal and uh, divergent thinking at baseline, and that was a negative one. So when you are high on diver divergent thinking on baseline, you're low on empathy. <laughs> That's also counterintuitive. Oh, he's just waving at somebody. Good. Then, this is my last slide. Um, I often get the question, well, this is divergent thinking, and you saw the task. What does it mean? that you're able to come up with these uh, associations. Because does it, does it matter? And then I'm thinking like, um, do you need, do, do these ideas have to be of use? Or is it more important that they are really able to think flexible, even if it doesn't make real sense, but then you, th that you step out of the one minute. Yeah, yeah, I'm finishing up. It's like this, divergent thinking is um, a prerequisite for creativity, but this is also very important. What is the future? Uh, I think we need more information about, um, doesn't matter which ceremony you take, um, doesn't matter which brew you take, or which country you've, uh, you, you undergo the ceremony. Um, I also think that it has to be compared with lab settings. I don't think that you will have these potential uh, potent effects in the lab setting. Uh, prospective studies would also be interesting to ask people, are you going to use the brew? And then follow them up in time. And also comparison with other psychedelics would be very interesting to see whether ayahuasca is a really special one or is that it's just the same like psilocybin or something. <laughs> um, I would like to thank participants, organizers of the retreat, also the organizers of this conference, and then the involved researchers. And that was it. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>